Well, good evening. My name, for those of you that don't know me, I see some familiar faces and some new faces um, on the screen tonight. I'm Jessica Mortinger, and I'm the Transportation Planning Manager for our Lawrence Douglas County Metropolitan Planning Organization. Um, and I'm here this evening with Ashley Breyers um, and transportation planner. And we're gonna work alongside a, a future appointed chair in a minute. Um, hopefully um, that you can do that as part of the meeting proceedings. And so uh, if you don't mind, we'll take a second and I have some ground rules to cover. Um, as you noted, this meeting is being recorded and it will be posted on the city's YouTube channel for a record of uh, this process um, to work on the pedestrian plan development of an update to the pedestrian plan as part of the pedestrian plan steering committee. We're really happy to have you this evening and we're glad you could make it to join us. Um, during the meeting, when you're not participating, um, please mute yourself by clicking on the microphone icon. Um, next to the video icon, when you're muted, a red line will appear over the icon. Um, muting your microphone makes it easier for everyone to hear. In some cases, we may mute people if we need to, to minimize distractions. Um, because we're on remote video and some people may be listening via audio only, please remember to state your name and uh, either the group you represent or your title, if that's appropriate. Um, for the benefit of everyone listening. Um, and you can turn your video on and off by clicking on the video icon for the purpose of the, this public meeting. Please keep your video on if you're participating in the meeting and when you're not participating, it's okay to turn your video off. Just remember to turn it back on if you're participating. Um, if you're participating by phone, you can click star six to uh, unmute your phone. And I will now turn it back over to Ashley and hopefully she can get us through uh, some introductions this evening since this is our first meeting. Thank you. I'm Ashley Breyers, Transportation Planner. I'm going to share my screen so we can all see the roster. Go. So I was hoping that we could go in order. So after the first person goes in down the list and you could say your name and who you're uh, representing. So very first is Althea. Hi, I'm Althea Schnocki. I'm the member at large. Then we have Frankie. Hi, um, I'm Frankie Haynes, um, and I am the Diversity and Equity Coordinator at the Lawrence Public Library and also a member of the United Way Human Services Coalition. Uh, is Kevin on? I don't think I saw Kevin. Nick? Hi, everybody. My name is Nick. Who's me? I serve on the Multimodal Transportation Commission, um, though I'm, I'm also on the Public Transit Advisory Committee. So um, I, I think in this capacity, I'm generally representing MMTC, but I, I guess I'm on both. So now you know. Gregory? <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Gregory uh, I Like Nick, I'm with the Multimodal Transit Commission. I didn't see Lance, I don't think, and David's not on. Uh, Lance, is oh, oh, Lance, Lance is here. Oh, Lance is here. Lance is here. I, I, my apologies. Uh, this is my first meeting on a new phone and phone number, and my photo and name did not come through, but I am here. Okay, I'm going to change your name for you. That's okay. Thank you. Please do so. All right. Thank you. Uh, I know David's not here, and Josh Spence. Hi, Josh Spence with Land and also Pinckney Neighborhood Association. Thank you. Dot. Hi, I'm Dot Neri. I'm representing the Healthy Built Environment Committee, a work group of Live Well Lawrence, and I've also been on the Independent Sink Access Task Force. And then Max. Hi everyone, my name is Max Schieber. Uh, I'm here representing Transportation Services at the University of Kansas. Wonderful, thank you. I'm going to stop sharing now and now we have some staff. So Dave Cronin, you wanna go first? Hello, Dave Cronin, at City Engineer um, and I'm in our, in our Municipal Services and Operations Department. Thank you. I actually forgot, Pat Collette is an uh, alternate member uh, from MMTC. Do you want to wave hi? <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Some other, uh, other staff we have, Amy. 
Hi, Amy Miller. I'm the Assistant Planning and Development Services Director. Thank you. We have Laura. Laura McCulloch, Community Health Planner with Lawrence Douglas County Public Health. Uh, Mark. Oh, you're muted. Thought I hit both buttons. Mark Reisky, University of Kansas, um, University Architect. Thank you. And then we have Ari, who is our intern. Hi, everyone. I'm Ari. I'm the MPO intern. Awesome. Thank you. So now uh, let me just make sure I didn't miss anybody. Oh, Jenny Kramer. Yes, I missed you. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm Jenny Kramer. I'm the Bicycle and Pedestrian Coordinator at the Kansas Department of Transportation. Awesome. Okay. Nobody else? All right. Back to Jessica then. Okay. So Jessica Morton's your transportation planning manager. I think you could tell from the introductions, we have a very broad representation of interests in our community. And um, you can see probably if you took a look at our uh, roster that we have a lot more interdepartmental participation on our staff team that we're working through this with and um, staff are encouraged to attend as, as needed um, to participate in these conversations with the steering committee. So you'll see maybe different staff um, at different points in that process, but we welcome you all and we're really um, thankful to have you here as part of this process. Um, if we go ahead and look to agenda item 1B, B1, um, we wanted to just kind of lay out um, as part of our process, um, just kind of what we think are some of some are some roles and responsibilities of members that we hope we can all agree to um, this evening. Um, I can, we can read through all of those, or if you've had a chance to read those, Ashley, do you want to share your screen real quick? Um, but we just really are hoping that you'll uh, be open to listen carefully and speak honestly in this process to read and learn and absorb all the information that's going to be presented and available. Uh, articulate your interests and concerns and perspectives on issues being addressed and maintain an open <coughs> mind regarding others' views because we're going to have some probably diverse values and perspectives. Um, and we really are hoping to focus on the big picture. We're doing a planning process. And so... Um, We'll try to be really thoughtful of what that means for our community. Um, we really hope this is a collaborative process and that people can uh, participate and let us know if they're not going to be here um, or and make sure they follow along with some of the agenda materials or watch the YouTubes after if you miss because we're going to be a pretty uh, responsive process that we will, if you miss a meeting, you might miss quite a bit of content. So um, we'll work with you to make sure we keep everybody up to date, um, including the members who are uh, unable to make it with us this evening. Um, as for standards, um, we uh, post agenda and materials one week in advance, just like advisory committees um, to the city and MPO have. Um, we have scheduled meetings already based on the avail majority availability of steering committee members. Um, and like I mentioned, staff advisors will attend as needed. And these meetings will be recorded and posted so you can view them later and they will be on the record as part of the development of this planning process. Is there any conversation or questions about any of the roles and responsibilities or the standards that we expect um, to be able to deliver to you through this process? Okay, I see a lot of head shakes. So. Well, we, again, thank you for being here. We'd like to take an opportunity to ask you to collectively appoint or select from among yourselves a chair and vice chair. Um, we at times can hopefully have uh, those people um, to help us facilitate these meetings um, to you know, read through the agenda, but also um, to help staff um, if we're trying to decide how to frame stuff or you um, to use um, kind of as a resource. So um, you're all new to each other. So I think it's going to probably take someone brave to decide um, that that's a role that you would be interested in taking for this process. Any thoughts or interest from anyone?
uh, Josh Spence. I think Nick could, uh, would be a perfect chair. Nick, is that something you're interested in for this process? Sorry, Josh, I didn't quite hear what you said. Your uh, microphone is kind of low. And I also have an air conditioning running in my background, sorry. Did you nominate any for chair? Is that what I'm gathering? So I'm, I'm technically a backup or a co-rep. It feels kind of weird to be chair. I don't know. I mean, if that doesn't matter, I can, I can give it a shot. Yeah. So Jessica Martin's your transportation planning manager. So kind of for this process, I don't envision, I mean, it's a collab, we hope it to be a collaborative process and um, it's hopefully guiding staff through the process. So it's, um, I don't envision us having thing, you know, hopefully we can come to collective agreements. It's not going to be things that we anticipate having formal action on a lot of things. It just kind of, this group can help guide the work. Um, and as such, you know, we, we've gone both ways. We've had staff staff these meetings entirely, um, or we've had other times when, because of the structure of the meeting, they've been led by an appointed chair or vice chair. So um, we put it out there as an option uh, for you. It sometimes maybe makes it feel like there's, you know, so staff just isn't running the whole process. Um, it's really at your discretion. I think for the most part of it, um, staff's doing all the work behind the scenes and it really is primarily helping facilitate the meetings and course in, in any correspondence we may need uh, to have. So I don't envision, envision that it's an issue as a co-representative of MMTC that that would be an issue. Excuse me, like MMTC. All right, well in that case, I'll throw my hat in the ring, so. But if anybody else wants a shot, I won't, you know, I won't get too crazy about it. Uh, Lance Fay here with, uh, I'm here for uh, pedest or for uh, Public Transportation Advisory Committee. Uh, I would support Nick being the, the chair for this as well. I think he'd do a good job and is uh, very uh, on top of all these uh, proceedings. So, and I'd, from what I can tell, I don't see any sort of conflict or issue in the scope of what we're doing. Thanks, Lance. Okay. Jessica Moringer, Transportation Planning Manager. Assuming there's no opposition to that, I'm not seeing a lot of discussion, we can we can do that by acclamation if there is no um, opposition to that. And then I would let Nick take over this conversation to hopefully appoint a counterpart vice chair and for in Nick's absence. Sounds good. Hey, Kuzmiak, MMTC, or just in case everybody forgets, MMTC stands for Multimodal Transportation Commission. I feel like on the commission, we all are really familiar with it, but it may take a while to get used to our acronym. So. Um, all right, so in that case, I would at this point solicit any nominations, self or otherwise, for vice chair. Because as a co representative, I may not be at every meeting. So if you wanted to run like one or two meetings, hey, this is your chance, right? I'm thinking it should be somebody not from the transportation side. I don't know if in my powers of chair is I actually, if I actually have the power to just name somebody. <laughs> Do I? I don't know. I don't know a lot of you very well, so I would feel bad just putting you on the spot if that's something you're really not into. So I'll give it a couple, a couple more awkward seconds here to see if I can get a nominee. Uh, would Josh Spence be interested? Lance Fay here, but nice to see Josh Spence there. I I would say consider that. Josh is currently vice, vice president of Pinkney Neighborhood Association, so that's not a bad fit, huh? Uh, I'm okay for it. Okay. And I'm also representing Leah too, so it wouldn't be a biggie for me. Josh, if there's any way for you to move closer to your microphone, that would be helpful for me. I'm not able to understand you very well, unfortunately. 
but that may just be me. I don't know. Um, do we have any um, other nominations? Any other notes of support, opposition, anything? All right. Well, in that case, um, I would move that we elect Josh Spence as vice chair of the Pedestrian Plan Steering Committee by acclamation. So unless I see any thumbs down or vigorous shakes of the head, then Josh, you're the vice chair. Now, I don't know what I have to do for the rest of the meeting. Jessica, is this going back to you for the rest? Yes, give Ashley a second to adjust the speaker. I, sh I think okay. she was gonna share a uh, screen, so I didn't have my stuff pulled up, but um, we were gonna, as part of our next item, take the opportunity to review and kind of walk through the existing conditions memo that was attached um, to the meeting agenda. We've done some kind of uh, background uh, research and work to tell you the story, I hope, uh, for those of you that some of you have been involved maybe since some of this, these other processes have happened in terms of the Bike Ped Issues Task Force or the previous um, countywide pedestrian planning work. And so, uh, but for those of you that weren't, we wanted to put together this document, which we envision kind of really is the start of the story to tell where we have been and where we are. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Ashley now that she's screen sharing as we can, so we can kind of walk through this um, and our documentation of what's happened since really since 2016. Ashley. Thank you, uh, Ashley Breyers, Transportation Planner. Hopefully this is zoomed in enough for you. Um, okay, All right. And hopefully we got Josh's volume a little better. I guess we'll see when he talks. Um, so yes, Jessica was talking about how we developed this existing conditions memo. And I think she might've said this, but I'll say it again in case she didn't. Uh, the last regional pedestrian plan was completed in October of 2016. And that was the first pedestrian plan ever done in Douglas County. And we've done a lot of things since then. Uh, so we wanted to catalog everything that's happened. And not only just the regional pedestrian plan, but also the pedestrian bicycle issues task force happened in 2016. And so there were two very big things in 2016 that occurred. And so in the pedestrian plan, there were all these recommendations. And so we went through and gave a status update on those. Um, you can read through those, but the main thing from looking at these is a lot of things have happened, like I mentioned. Uh, a really big one is this dedicated funding, which we'll talk about more later, and this establishment of the Multimodal Transportation Commission. Uh, any, I guess, as I'm going through this, any questions for me about this table before I scroll past it? Okay. So then I'm gonna go to the Pedestrian Bicycle Issues Task Force. So this one again, mentioned creating a transportation commission and uh, allocating some of the infrastructure sales tax to bike ped fund projects. All these other things that we've done. And we you know, had known that we'd done a lot of work, but we hadn't actually like, you know, written it all out. And so when we created this chart, it was amazing to see how far we've come. Uh, this walk friendly designation uh, in 2017, we were designated silver. Okay, and then there's all of the infrastructure projects that have happened. So there have been three years worth of Safe Russell School projects that were funded through KDOT. Also several loop projects funded through KDOT. Uh, the red ones here are under construction now or soon. And the purple and orange ones are happening in the next few years. So blue are the only ones that are not planned for. And then we have road projects that have included sidewalks as well. So altogether, we've had 9.75 miles of new sidewalk since 2016, which is awesome. Here's the silver walk friendly and the development of the Multimodal Transportation Commission, which uses the non-motorized projects prioritization policy, which will be discussed later. 
and they provide recommendations to the city commission. So they review transportation items and then have the public process and then provide recommendations to the city commission. So then the, the rest of this document is all about the different programs that have happened since 2016. And there's quite a bit of information on in here, so I won't read it you know, word for word to you, but uh, I'll hit the high points. And please stop me if you have any questions. Um, please do, because I don't wanna blow past something if you have questions. Uh, so the very first thing we're talking about is the dedicated city pedestrian and bicycle funding. And prior to 2016, there, were, there was no funding set aside for bike ped projects. So they were only included in larger road projects or grant projects through KDOT. So in 2016, as a outcome of the Ped Bike Issues Task Force and the pedestrian plan, money was set aside for specific bike ped projects. And then when the tax re referendum was up for vote in 2017, the city allocated a portion of that funding towards bike ped projects. And that will be sunsetting in uh, April of 2029. There's also a dedicated funding line for ADA ramp funding. And the city expects to receive money from community development block grant in order to do sidewalks as well. And so this table, oh, let's see, Greg just, okay. This table shows all the different funding sources since 2016. And the dedicated ADA ramp funding was originally lumped in with the pedestrian and bicycle funding. But since 2020, it is separated out. And um, this KDOT administered grants one is all the different transportation alternatives projects that KDOT has funded. So in 2018, there were two very large projects, the tunnel under Iowa and 19th Street is there. And there was something else that year, but then we have money in 2021 awarded and 2023, a very large chunk in 2023. And the city will continue to apply for these grants as they're available. Okay. And like I mentioned, the non-motorized projects prioritization policy is used to determine which projects are funded with this dedicated bike ped funding. I'll talk about that a little bit more too. The sidewalk improvement program has been a controversial item. And starting in 2019, the city started doing a multi-year plan in order to start actually enforcing it and meeting, helping property owners meet this Kansas code here. In addition to that, cities improving ADA sidewalk. Um, and these are just pictures of all the different things that inspectors are looking for when they are doing their inspections. It's just helpful to know that. And so in the first year, I'm gonna scroll down to this map first. First year, the city was divided into zones and inspections were done over here. And then in year two, inspections were done over here. In year three, we decided to do a data driven process to look at demand and used uh, the mapping program GIS in order to uh, do flows of where people are actually walking and used this route preference. So it was more preferable to have people on you know, the green stars, so with sidewalks on the different streets. And then also use these destinations and weighted them. And this is the same as the Multimodal Transportation Commission's non-motorized prioritization policy. And then added in some equity considerations. So the transportation disadvantaged population looks at all of these different census categories because we know historically people who fall into these categories have more transportation disadvantages or could. And so we downloaded the information from the census by block group and found the averages for the whole city and then 
gave points based on how far that block group was from the average. And that information was then incorporated into the demand model that was created. And so in year three, the purple lines were the areas that were inspected. The blue are brick sidewalks, which is a whole other thing. But so we were looking at the, the purple. And once they started doing the inspections, realized that they were actually worse off than they thought they would be. And so they're going to do kind of two projects, one where they're spot repairing and the other where they're going to completely reconstruct whole blocks because once you do you know, four or five different spots, you might as well do the whole thing. So that'll be a future project because there's no budget for that right now. And so that's where we are with that program right now. Any questions so far on what I've talked about? Okay. So the next program is the Neighborhood Traffic Management Program, which replaced the old traffic calming program because if we do traffic calming on one street, it just pushes the, the congestion problems to the other streets around it. And so realized that we needed to think comprehensively and, and try to do a whole neighborhood program uh, instead of just individual streets. And these are the goals for that effort. And there's a pilot program that's going to be happening with uh, different tools here, chicanes, speed cushions, radar signs. Etc. There was also the Safer Neighborhood Speeds campaign, which started and is still going on. Hopefully you've seen these signs uh, talking about slowing down and looking out and stopping for people. We have survey metrics. Uh, they did a pre-campaign and a post-campaign survey and found out you know, how people feel about how the campaign went. And it's being relaunched right now in order to reach university students since with, well, COVID still going on, but with COVID stuff in the spring, not all the students were, you know, in town. Maybe there's more now, hopefully. Um, the speed limit reduction also happened. So the city installed 25 mile per hour signs on neighborhood streets that were not already 25 miles per hour or less, which is this map. So all the red lines are now 25 miles an hour. They used to be 30. Yellow was ex is existing 20 and blue is existing 25. It was a large chunk of the streets. Okay. And as part of this effort, the Lawrence Police Department enforced the updated speed limit and we'll be continuing to do different enforcement activities. Uh, and one other thing is residents can submit traffic safety concerns if they have any at this link here, because um, we're going to be continuing to evaluate all of this. Safe House School Plan. So the Safe House School program in Lawrence started in 2014 and uh, decided we needed to write a plan. And so between 2019 and 2020, the MPO, Metropolitan Planning Organization, the public health, the school and the city all worked together to create this citywide Safe Rest School plan, which is for all of the public elementary and middle schools. And it was approved in November after a bit of a COVID delay. But through this process, we asked a lot of very specific questions regarding Safe Routes to School. And this chart here is kind of interesting. On the left side are all pie charts regarding routes or Safe Routes to School routes and sidewalks on Safe Routes to School routes. This one is all about sidewalk on routes that are not Safe Routes to School routes. And we asked a question of, so we only have so much city money how should we prioritize spending the city money? And these are the responses. Should we try to have sidewalks on both sides of the street for major streets that are a safe route? And the green is both sides. 
uh, purples one side. So 92% said yes. 89 or 80% said yes for collector streets and just over ha half said yes for local streets. So then when you're looking at streets that are not safe Russell school routes, uh, similar ish until we get down to local streets where uh, one side was the bigger portion of it. And of course, this is just for city funding on you know, city projects, sidewalks being funded with city money. Uh, the land development code still requires sidewalk on both sides of the street for new development. But this is something that we'll need to discuss through this process. Um, we also developed these different maps as part of it. This infrastructure one shows different projects that need to be done. So gap projects in order to have continuous sidewalk on one side of the street for local streets or both sides of the street for collectors and arterials for safe routes to school, that is. This is an encouragement map in order to show students and parents where to actually walk or bike. Uh, so it doesn't include where the projects are because we don't want to send you know, somebody to go walk where there's not a sidewalk. And this traffic circulation map is just to show how to do uh, pick up and drop off because we realized it wasn't consistent across the board. The plan also updated or called for revisions to the school area traffic control policy, which was updated in August. And it added middle schools and these different things. It also created evaluation criteria for adult crossing guards. And it brought together, or formed, I guess, that are suggested, this MOU, Memorandum of Understanding, between the school district and the city in order to create a formal Safe Rest of School Working Group, which uh, has been created. And so that's the group that will be going forward doing the Safe Rest of School work. Uh, any questions about any of that? Ashley, um, this yeah. is Dot Neary from the um, Healthy Booth Environment Group. I, I probably should know this, but one question. When the plan switched from um, addressing sidewalk from zones to more an equity-based plan, is mm -hmm. the plan still for homeowners to be charged? I'm just thinking about some of those groups or people who probably are low income. Is, is that a reasonable question or is it too long to answer? Sorry, uh, Jessica, can you answer while I turn the light on? Yeah. Okay. Um, so actually, I think Dave, maybe can you answer that question about how si the change in the assistance or what's going to happen with moving from the zones of demand where there's could be perceived more people eligible for the program? Yeah, <clears throat> this is Dave Cronin. Uh, we, we haven't made any change uh, on that due to the prior of the locations. Um, so there's still a, um, there's still criteria for, um, or applications for assistance for low income okay. um, folks uh, to apply for assistance through that program. So that's hasn't changed from the, uh, in, you know, in the last year with the, uh, the prioritization in the, uh, Jake Baldwin can make it this evening. He's also on this um, committee for <laughs> on the staff level. He's the lead of that uh, that program, and so um, we're certainly going to keep him in the conversations as we move forward with this planning committee. So that's helpful. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Okay. While you're thinking, I'm going to go back to where I was, so don't get seasick. All right, so I will move on. This is where I was, yeah. Uh, Ashley Breyer's transportation planner. The right-of-way management program was also improved. Uh, prior to this improvement in 2019, things like this happened, where closed sidewalk signs were just put right in front of where a sidewalk was closed and no real detours were provided or anything like that. And so the new requirements uh, require a temporary traffic control plan, which needs to have a detour route. 
and uh, has different requirements based on if there's sidewalk on the other side of the street or not. So if there is sidewalk on the other side of the street, a sign saying you need to cross here so you can continue walking on a sidewalk and making sure the sign is all the way across the sidewalk so people don't accidentally walk around it and then into something bad. If there is not a sidewalk on the other side of the street, there's some other ways to address that. Uh, you can make this like protected barrier in the street or have another comparable surface that would provide an alternative route. And that's what all of this says, basically. The other program is the uh, signal coordination and pedestrian clearance time updates that were completed. In 2020, 2021, a consultant looked at several different uh, corridors and the traffic signal timing for those locations and studied vehicle travel times and intersection uh, geometries and looked at the most recent standards for what the timing should be. And based on all of that, the vehicle yellow and red and pedestrian walk and flashing don't walk clearance times were modified, often resulting in increased clearance times for users. So that's good. Um, they're also going to be doing this future work on some other corridors in 2021, 2022 as well. So that's all of the prior work that's happened since 2016. So now we have the gaps and needs. And so I'm going to sh change screens and Jessica's going to talk about it. Okay, Jessica Mortinger, Transportation Planning Manager. So as you can tell, um, there's been a lot of different um, programs and projects that um, have been in the works since we have done this last plan. But we have recognized also that there is a need um, through conversations with the Multimodal Transportation Commission and PTAC and others that there's still additional work um, or goals and objectives. Ashley, you're going to have to make that text bigger probably for us to be able to read it at least on the left side, but thank you. Um, and so we wanted to have an opportunity to talk about um, what, what we as staff internally and from for listening to those community conversations have heard that the gaps are still in terms of the needs for additional planning work to identify um, programs, projects, policies that should be improved to improve walkability in our, in our community. And as part of that, um, we can kind of go through um, this list, and then we'd really be interested in hearing what your thoughts or concerns are um, from your experiences and some sort of discussion about the, the validity of um, some of these things, or if there's caveats we should ensure we're thoughtful about as we all go through this process, or if there's something um, glaring that you think that we're, that we're missing that should be part of the conversation. Um, as part of our planning process, in addition to having our steering committee work, um, uh, we will have a public participation plan. So we will be doing public engagement with the community around um, many of these items. And uh, depending on the work and how technical or how um, much we still need to find out about where the community value lies, we'll kind of guide how we do that process and what types of things we ask the community in our surveys, in our tabling, in our open houses um, that are just as concept level right now, kind of planned for what we envision this process to be. So um, as part of that, we realize that so far we have out of that in the non-motorized prioritization program, there are gaps identified along arterial streets and collector streets. Those are the major roadways in our community. And then on local streets, we've identified gaps along one side of all the remaining safe routes to school routes. Um, it is probably too much at this point to envision um, sidewalks on both sides of every street in our community um, in the sense for fiscal reality to really prioritize um, investments where we believe they will make the most impact. Um, and so 
we really, though, do need to consult with the community to, de to determine what that long-term vision is for a city sidewalk network, um, particularly thinking about what, what does that mean for when new development is occurring in some of those community conversations that have occurred around housing affordability and whether or not sidewalk should be required on both sides as a condition of that, um, and or even redevelopment of neighborhoods at what point when you're redeveloping in a neighborhood or on a street that has no sidewalk, whether a variance um, should be granted or an agreement not to protest um, in some of those considerations. So thinking about the long-term vision. Then thinking about city resources again for non-motorized prioritization. We remember we've talked about arterial, collector, and safe routes to school gaps, um, but we really want to explore kind of as the next uh, facet of that access to bus, so bus stops for transit access, access to healthy food destinations, um, and access to parks. And all three of those other community identified destinations are identified um, in our city of Lawrence most recent strategic plan um, through performance measure reporting that they're starting um, to be interested in for strategic plan. Um, there's also ties back to quality of life and health in our community health improvement plan. So that is, that is on our list. We, um, we are hoping to elevate equity as part of this conversation. Um, and Ashley mentioned the transportation disadvantaged block groups based on populations in our community that have transportation vulnerability, um, less, li less likely to access maybe a car or more reliant on transit or walking or biking or getting rides from others. And what, and what does that mean in the sense of uh, how the existing sidewalk network and condition of sidewalk is distributed across those block groups, um, both with transportation disadvantage, but also with minority block groups alone to really understand if there is disparity in our built environment um, that we could attempt to target with some uh, specific projects or programs. And so that's something we're really hoping to bring at the equity lens into this process and to hopefully use data to tell that story and help answer some of those questions across our community. We have heard um, for the need for improved uh, crossing, um, pedestrian crossing safety and comfort. And so thinking about um, the inclusion of crossing improvements in the non-motorized prioritization program uh, to get funded for improvements and particularly thinking about um, unsignalized crossing. So places where maybe a, a local street or a collector street cross an arterial street um, and or a um, or, or a local collect crosses a collector street where there's a lot of uh, pedestrian demand and there could be improved safety regarding speed or traffic volume or crossing distance and what that means in terms of which design elements are appropriate solutions um, based on some of that criteria. And there's some federal guidance we'll look at and explore for its appropriateness in this community, as well as deciding, I think, hopefully identifying some locations that we could um, start a process to regularly work uh, with municipal services and operations um, and our engineering uh, staff to get evaluated for proposed designs. Um, and then there's some interest also, I think, to research at controlled crossings or signalized intersections if there is appropriate design um, and within the city street design standards um, and evaluate that uh, appropriate balance to meet our walkability goals. Because I, there's still, I think, concern about, um, you know, oftentimes when geometric improvements are added to an intersection like that. So when a turn, turn lanes are added um, or there's dual turn lanes, so there's two next to each other, that adds the, to the crossing distance um, for people. And so I think there is a balance um, in our community where we talk about walkability goals um, and on the other side of that is throughput and uh, people's desire to get across town and to destinations quickly in cars. And I think we have to um, have that conversation about some of those conflicting values moving forward. Um, we believe that there can be there can be additional work in our partners at Lawrence Transit um, is, as a 
as a, a staff team partner, um, are working on uh, bus stop amenities. You may have seen their most recent rollout of, uh, of bus stop amenities. So thinking about placemaking and thinking about ADA access in regards to transit accessibility and routes that access transit and how that impacts multimodal trip making. Um, and then we are hoping to coordinate with the conversations um, of on, there's a brick street committee um, going on right now, working on some design standards and considerations around historic considerations about brick streets and sidewalks um, that will impact sidewalk improvement, could also impact other city programs. And so while we won't do all that work um, as part of this process, we're hoping to coordinate the result of what is, uh, is determined in, this, in that separate process. And then um, at, at large, um, the last thing kind of on our list is to evaluate some of the other national best practices around walkability. So um, from that Highway Research Center that does the walk-friendly communities, we received the silver level designation, but what does it take to get to gold or platinum? Um, and thinking about some of those other things. So we talked a little bit about placemaking. Are there other considerations around programs or policies that we should be exploring, um, you know, for implementation. So that's a really huge list, um, but we were, we were trying to frame the scope of this project. And so we've thrown a lot of information at you, but I'd like to hear how, if that resonates with you, if there are other things you think that are missing from our needs analysis um, for the planning work that we intend to do as, as part of this process. Okay, so the Kuzmiak MMTC. Let's, uh, I feel like if we just um, open the floor, maybe a lot of people may be reluctant to share. So I think I may start calling on people to get a little bit more targeted uh, commenting here. So my idea here is that all of you are on this committee, hopefully not just because you were voluntold, but because you have a true interest mm -hmm. in trying to at least maintain the pedestrian infrastructure we have, if not make it better um, for everybody all across the city. And I, I'm hoping that I can see that passion kind of translate into some interaction. So um, that may not be tonight. It may be that you read all this and you're still soaking it in. I mean, I've been on Multimodal Transportation Commission for two and a half years now. And thankfully that this is all a review to me because a lot of this happened while I was there. But this is a lot of information for somebody who's not mm -hmm. super familiar with this. So um, I think what I want to at least start with is I'm going to throw out a few comments based on what I've read, and what I understand at this point, and hopefully that will inspire some others to jump in and maybe build off of this. So um, let's see. I've been taking some notes. The first thing I wanted to note is I think that it's important to look at the idea of sidewalks on, on every street because Jessica, like you were saying, it's it's natural to want the, the, the amenities that you feel are necessary on every possible street, right? But there are budget realities. I think uh, there are two ways to go about doing this, right? The first way is to um, just say, based on the streets that we currently have, we gotta prioritize ones that people are going to walk along as arterials or collectors or something like that. And the smaller ones, you know, it is what it is, right? We'll eventually get to them if we ever have the money. Maybe we can maintain them, maybe not. But that kind of fails to look at the bigger picture of why are these streets unfriendly to walk on in the first place? Mm -hmm. So those of you who are familiar to, with maybe Brook Creek or North Lawrence know that there's some really skinny streets in this community that don't have sidewalks. And sometimes they end up functioning as okay from um, multiple modes of transportation simply because they're so narrow that drivers naturally slow down on them and it makes it a little bit more comfortable to be a walker or a biker on them. So if you don't mind, I was going to see if I could maybe share my screen and show you a couple of, of examples of what I'm looking at. And if that's not a feature at this conference, that's okay. I can move right along. I don't know if uh, Ashley Briars, you should be able to, I think. Okay. Actually, okay. Oh, yeah. oh, I can't do it while you're doing it, apparently. There we go. Okay. Well, let's see if I can figure this out. All right. Let me bring up the... There you go. All right. So there's a couple of just get it out of the way. There's a couple of, uh, of ideas for those of you who've had the privilege to travel where other countries are able to 
mix all modes, um, but slow them all down to roughly the same speed, such that it's okay for everybody to be on the same street at the same time. So when I think of multimodal transportation, I think of something like this, where it truly is multiple modes. I mean, you can see three right here. Um, mm -hmm. I can share the street and not worry about being hurt because the car literally can't go more than 10 or 15 miles an hour. You'd have to really mess up to hurt somebody on this, right? And this isn't just in, you know, the progressive enlightened spots like uh, the Netherlands, Denmark. Japan is really particularly good at it. There's a ton of streets in the back, um, you know, the back streets of Tokyo that have lines to kind of designate where a car might want to prefer to be or where a bike might want to go or a sidewalk. But they don't have sidewalks because they don't need to. The speeds are so slow that instead of, of segregating uses um, by the type of mode, we segregate them by speed. So everybody on this street is the exact same speed. And it kind of works. This looks old, but this is actually from the late 90s in Sweden. Um, it's not just a traditional city thing. It's something that anybody can do. The problem is it may not be in our scope. This is Mexico, I think. Um, something like this may not necessarily be, be in our scope because um, it's not just the transportation side of things. It's planning, um, it's, it, it's engineering. It's a lot of things that come together to form the built environment that we currently have. So I guess what, 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 what I'm looking to get out of this diverse collection of perspectives here is, is how can we see the bigger picture and not just focus on where to put more sidewalks, how good are the sidewalks gonna be? How much are they gonna cost? But why do we need sidewalks in the first place for places where maybe the speed should only be 10 or 15 miles an hour for cars? So that's one of the um, items I'd like to focus on as we go through here. And um, some of you may or may not be aware, but um, there's this kind of intersection between planning, zoning, and land use and transportation in that, say, the way you plot out a suburb makes it less amenable to walking around and accessing amenities. Whereas the way you plot out a traditional city like uh, Amsterdam or uh, Western Missouri even, makes it much more amenable to being able to get from place to place on different modes of, of transportation. So the way you plan affects the way you tr transport oneself, I guess. Um, uh, subsequently, the, the way you transport yourself to, uh, uh, affects the way you plan. So if everybody's already used to driving cars and parking for free, five feet in front of their destination, it's much more likely that you're going to want to continue that. So you're going to yeah. want to require minimum parking and really large roads and very high speeds and very short traffic light cycles. So it's kind of a vicious cycle. At some point, if we, if we zoom out and see how these are connected to each other, we may be able to, as a steering committee, provide some input to all these different staff groups that are gathered um, to see if we can, I guess, affect some more substantial change in how we look at how people walk around the city. So... That's my soapbox. Um, the, the other quick thing I wanted to bring up was that, what was the other one? Um, let's see, sorry. The idea of placemaking, I think it is a really critical part of walkability. And when I was in, well, I wasn't involved, I was a spectator. There was a walkability subcommittee when I lived in Houston. And it was really interesting to see what Houstonians thought walkability looked like. I was a little sad, honestly, but there's, there's a difference between someplace simply being walkable, like there's a sidewalk, um, to it actually being a walkable place that you want to spend time in. So mm -hmm. though the sidewalks in downtown Lawrence are fine, they're pretty good. And the sidewalks in Prairie Park are fine, they're pretty good. One of these is a place you'd want to spend time in, one of these places you live in, right? It's a little bit different. So to make these walkable places, it, it, it takes this kind of placemaking that just goes pointing out things like tree coverage, good lighting, so it's safe to walk in at night, uh, shading. So it's comfortable walking in this, in the extreme heat. Um, and it gets to an interesting point that I, I recently came across. And that is that if you think of a structure or a building, usually an, an architect will design how it looks and an engineer will design how it functions. And they have to work together to make sure the whole thing comes together properly for its intended use and for its benefit for the users, right? The same thing could be said of streets. It, they need engineering to be able to function properly as a street for the uses that you intend. But it also kind of takes an architect to get that user experience to be appropriate for what you're trying to get to. Um, there's a reason downtown looks a lot different. It's got the flower boxes, the planners, the benches, the bump outs. Um, it's almost as if it was designed by a planner or an, or an architect in addition to an engineer. So I guess what I'm saying is bringing more of the art, 
artistic, shall we say, element into how we get around town could add some of the incentive that maybe some people need who are on the fence of di ditching their car for a couple of chips and walking or biking just because not only is it possible, but it's actually kind of enjoyable. All right. Um, hey, Lance Fay here. I got I got a mouthful for you. Good. Let's, let's hear okay. it. Okay. So I'm a lifelong pedestrian and I've lived in Lawrence for quite a while and I walk a lot of our streets and sidewalks. I'm also vice chair of the uh, uh, public transportation advisory committee. So I ride buses to get around. And so I, I'm glad to see uh, the coordination and the various groups looking at what we're doing. It is important that we look at the uniqueness in the, the details that make Lawrence the community it is and the neighborhoods within Lawrence, the neighborhoods they are, uh, and that we understand the uh, driving habits as well as walking, biking, and busing habits of, of the people in our particular community. Uh, I could easily list you a couple of streets that not only do they not have sidewalks and you would think them as residential streets, but they are streets that drivers use as highways. Um, I could enable you some brick sidewalks in both uh, East Lawrence uh, and Pinckney and in the Oread neighborhood that are very hazardous and will take very, you know, and oftentimes not well lit. So there's a lot of, a lot of things that, uh, I would be happy to contribute. Um, you know, right now is not going to be the time to make the list, but seeing the multi-group coordination to address this is encouraging. And I just say that we need to kind of, uh, it's nice to look at where things are done other places, but this is a unique town with unique uh, characteristics, unique neighborhoods, uh, unique traffic patterns, and um, there's there's a lot of challenges uh, to make things more connected and safe, um, ADA compliant. Uh, I, one thing in particular that I'm concerned about as we talk about our old brick sidewalks, uh, gee, historical preservation is really neat and all, but uh, safety in walking those sidewalks maintaining them, particularly when it's uh, icy or snowy or rainy. And uh, I think also we have some policy things to talk about uh, when it comes to how we clear winter weather and how we deal with uh, how businesses allow water and things to drain and, and uh, how, how that affects access and safety. So there's a lot of details here and I'm encouraged with what I'm hearing. Uh, but we need to look very carefully at specific streets, specific business entrances and exits. The, the, the specifics is where this really, that's where, where the, uh, the rubber meets the road, shall we say, whether it be your shoes or a tire. Um, that's where we really, we need to be looking carefully because we're talking about how we allocate and get money. Uh, to take care of these things. And a lot of these things are super, super local, like in front of your house local. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And I may be asking about a couple of the other subcommittees, particularly the brick sidewalk one. Um, and I encourage people to take any chance you get to walk a street you don't normally walk particularly at a time you don't normally walk it. Take a bus you don't normally take. Do something you don't normally do transportation-wise and see for yourself and feel for yourself how it is. And then come back and uh, see if you have any more specifics that you might want to add to this. Okay, that's my soapbox. Thanks. Thank you, Lance. Thank you, Kuzmiak, MMTC rep. Uh, Jessica, I noted in the, I guess, the first item of this agenda that I think one of the points was to think the big picture. And I don't know if that is a avoidance of getting into the weeds or not, but I see where Lance is coming from. And I want to be able to still harness that hyper-local knowledge to figure out examples of where things are particularly bad, um, potential solutions for how, how those could improve. And even though we, we, we may not be able to solve those examples from this platform. 
could we at least begin to make the, I guess, the, the genesis of some kind of index or policy or algorithm, something that makes it possible for a city of 100,000 people to prioritize things without having to know the right person in the right neighborhood to figure out the, the worst issue. Because I think if we have enough examples um, and potential solutions from our staff members, then maybe we can start to form what an improvement might look like, right? I mean, that's how we got to, to the point of safe routes to schools, I believe. There was a lot of kind of high level GIS analysis of figuring out who walks where and how much and how about other roads, blah, blah, blah. And then there was the more diving down into details, talking to the PTOs and the parents and trying to figure out, okay, we can guess where the bad places are, but where are they really? And both of those sources of information are really important. And I wonder if we can figure out a, a, a similar idea to for, for example, an output of this could be to improve the uh, sidewalk gap plan. I forget exactly what it's called. Or the non-motorized pri project prioritization program. Um, we as MMTC do our best with the knowledge and lived experience that we have. But, I mean, if we can crib from ideas that come from this group, all the better, right? So, anyway. Yeah, Jessica Morton, your transportation planning manager. I think in the big picture, we're, you're right. We're At the beginning, we really don't want to... We can use some local examples as examples to reasons why we want to target certain types of projects or policies, but we don't want to get caught up on too many just certain projects and only have a project list that's 10 projects. And when it gets done, it's done because I think there's a lot of more bigger holistic issues. And I think that's really what we are hoping to um, lead you with in terms of big, big picture. We also know that, um, people are very passionate about their own experiences. And when, when we talk to people, we will take our data and share our data and information and, and or process. And then we will also hear from some people who they, they want to weigh in on the whole vision for the community. And there'll be other people who um, as part of that public process, very specifically want to tell us about their one curb ramp, their one piece of sidewalk um, that matters to them in a trip. And we will collect those things also, and hopefully be able to reflect that the policies and programs can hopefully address those on a more holistic citywide level. The thing we really, really try to want to prevent is just whoever comes in um, weighs in the loudest, um, get something. Because I think oftentimes there's other people who, you know, across our community who need things also or need projects and programs. And just because we don't hear from them as loud in the process doesn't mean their need is any less valuable. And so we are trying to balance all of those things. But I think Lance makes some really good points about um, things that we should consider. And just for point of reference for all of the members of this committee, we recognize that the capital improvement program for the city has um, the development of the ADA transition plan for the public right-of-way planned for 2023. And so while we won't be able to do all of that work as part of this process, we know that that will be coming future action um, that we envision could largely impact um, the transition of it right, right away to ADA. Um, the other thing I would mention, and we haven't yet really is, um, next year in 2022, the city has a process in the, in the capital improvement plan to update the land development code. So many of the opportunities, Nick, I think you're speaking of in regards to how the form and function of our land use and transportation impact each other will have opportunities and also some public process to explore some of those relationships in a in, in the in the update to the land development code. So just to be kind of aware, there are a lot of other continuous processes. And so we'll try to reflect and advance, I think, as much as we can as part of this process. And there will be other things that are tied in. Um, and, and Dave, um, I, I assume you can put Lance in touch with the BRIC committee also. So thank you for your comments so far. Anybody else who hasn't spoken, we'd love to hear what you think or where if you think we're missing something josh spence uh, uh personally i feel that definitely it's like that when it does come into play the ada stuff when those projects start to come into play because they definitely do affect the pedestrian planning 
And it definitely should be something that should be thought about because there are so many people, people in Lawrence that are in some form disabled and having that proper ADA compliance or planning in place definitely could make a difference. And I think that would be something in the big picture that could be looked at. Yeah. And Jessica Mortinger, Transportation Planning Manager, there is a ADA transition plan that's been around for a number of years. And um, the city's currently operating under that transition plan. And they are currently doing work in terms of you. When we look at the budget and the programmed uh, priorities, there are investments being made in ADA. Um, and so that some of that's being tracked, but I, I do agree there's additional work to be done. And part of the determination around sidewalk improvement really yielded to that in terms of doing spot repair in some places where the, the intensity of defects was so large to um, just to work on a, a program to really reconstruct those blocks is really, really with an end goal inside of accessibility. And so I think while that might take longer to figure out how that's going to be funded and what that's going to look like, I think the end goal will really be a, lar a large benefit to people who um, rely on that as their mobility. This is Laura McCulloch with Public Health. And I just wanted to say that I definitely um, support the idea of safe routes to parks and safe routes to food. Um, just an example of in my own community where I live in the neighborhood I live, I live right next to Naismith Park. And um, it's interesting, the park has like a really nice um, path, but then there's no sidewalks as soon as you leave the park. And so it's interesting, it doesn't connect to sidewalks to get you um, at, in and out of the park. So I think that adding that would be a benefit um, in communities where there's parks or trails located like that. Um, and I also just had a general question that you all may know, is there some sort of a policy for um, when or where street lights are placed? Dave? Yeah. Um, Dave, can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Dave Cronin, city engineer. <clears throat> um, we do have a policy and uh, we ins on in residential neighborhoods, we install street lights at, um, at intersections and at cul-de-sacs. Of course, on arterial streets, we have street lights along the streets and at signalized intersections. Um, we're having uh, we, we've identified the need to, uh, to update our, our streetlight policy and maybe come up with some criteria, particularly for, um, for crossings and what the intensity needs to be. Um, but generally speaking, um, it is uh, for neighborhoods, it's at, cul at cul-de-sacs and at intersections, and that's it. And those are all maintained by uh, Evergy. So this, okay. um, we, uh, and new sub subdivisions, um, the developer works with Evergy to put those in and they maintain them and the city pays a uh, uh, per light fee through our agreement with them. This is Dot Neri from the Healthy Built Environment Work Group. I think the issue of crossing times um, is increasingly important as the population ages for a retirement destination. So I think that is something um, that we really need to look at seriously for safety. And if, if, you, if you don't think you're gonna get across the street in time, you're probably not gonna walk, you're gonna try to take other means of transportation. So as a wheelchair user, that's a big issue. Would it be of interest, so, and this might be just a question, um, Jessica Martin, your transportation planning manager, for all of you to, is there interest, um, DOT, to go test out? I don't know if you've been in the, in the new corridors to see the difference in terms of timing in real life from some of the, sig from some of the coordinator, uh, corridors that have been re-coordinated you know, uh, signals uh, to test any of those timings to see if you, what's the real life experience? Do they feel adequate based on what the standards are 
is that of interest? Because I know that there's probably some interest um, probably from Multimodal Transportation Commission of taking some video to see what that's like to be able to share with people what that means maybe. I think it might be good. Um, I'd like to know where those places are. And I think maybe the Access Task Force at Independent Sync and the Self-Advocate Coalition of Kansas might be interested in that. I, I, I check out a few. Okay. Uh, Lance Fay here. Um, I would be interested in assisting, you know, providing information on intersections and crossings that, that I use. Um, there have been some pretty good improvements over the past few year, years, but there are still some areas where crossing times are pretty short. And I have reported issues with crossing times before. So that's something that I do think is a valid concern and, and is something that needs some coordination to be fixed appropriately. So, it, yeah, if there's any way I can provide input from what I experience or can arrange for other people to provide input but for places that, say, are too short of a crossing time, mm -hmm. then by all means, I think that is important. This is Jenny um, Kramer at KDOT, and sorry, I moved my computer around. And um, I had recently gone through the pedestrian fatalities from 2020 to see exactly what was going on. And a lot of those intersection fatalities were, could be seen as a result of, yeah, like too short of, of for the signal, the walk signal. So it was like, oh, they crossed on a do not walk, but did it change before they got across? Was that the issue? But then also, um, you know, being able to turn left in a car um, when the pedestrian also is walking and they don't see the pedestrian, like what happened in Lawrence on 19th. And um, same with right turns. So I don't know if Lawrence would ever be bold enough to restrict right or left turn. Um, like signals. So it's not just like you can turn right on red or you can turn left on um, on the green, like in more places anyway. Hmm. Excuse me, I'm in TC Rev. Jenny, thank you for reminding me. I tossed this around a while ago and I kind of forgot about it, but until you talk about my memory. Um, yeah, there are, I mean, honestly, more pedestrian fatalities in Lawrence than there should be, which is zero. But I feel like it's um, the more I read on things like you know strong towns and uh, Atlantic cities or whatever it's called these days, it's that there's this push in a lot of countries for Vision Zero that there really shouldn't be any pedestrian fatalities, and a lot of those are you know due to human error, but human error that was kind of enabled and made worse by the way things are designed and how different modes come together. So. I would be particularly curious if there was any sort of mechanism for either a serious injury or a fatality to trigger somewhat of an investigation to kind of see what went uh, wrong. And I come from the previously oil and gas industry, now environmental, kind of strange switch, but in the oil and gas industry and other kind of heavy industry situations, there's a lot of focus on, on reviewing process accidents and fatalities and seeing what was like the proximate cause? What was the ultimate cause? How do we make sure this never happens again? Is it something that's systemic to our industry? Is it something that was just a total freak accident? And if there, are, if there are any lessons learned, how can we implement those in the future to make sure people don't get hurt or killed by stuff that we do every day? Um, you know, if, if there was an explosion at a refinery, right, that would be a huge investigation. Um, and I, I think pedestrian and other traffic fatalities in the U.S. are unfortunately so common, like I said, I think a lot of them maybe don't get the attention they deserve in terms of like, how can we figure out how to prevent these in the future? Instead of just telling somebody, you know, be more careful when you walk around, right? Mm -hmm. There's- uh, That's the default. And I, I do feel like every time a pedestrian is killed, it's uh, like they're often blamed or they weren't wearing bright clothing or um, yeah, they didn't yield to the car. You know, they were trying to cross mid block say in, and say a car was speeding, but it's still their fault because they were they didn't yield um, or it didn't look well enough. And I, I was impressed in Wichita recently, uh, a woman was 
killed when she was coming out of a brewery, I think down in like, I think old town and like right away, I don't know why it was different, but for some reason this, you know, people in the city, maybe it was because of their, their bike head group or something, but immediately like they were trying to see like what went wrong and, and how can we make it safer and, um, and, and it would be great if that happened with, it seemed like most pedest- like traditional pedestrian fatalities that I read about, um, like I, there's, there's probably some, something we could do, some road configuration that could change and um, yeah, trying to like figure that out. And at a city level, like you have more power to be able to do that um, with, I mean, hopefully prevent, but then when it does happen, go out and figure out what went wrong and how that could be changed. So it sounds like there's maybe a precedent for something like that in Kansas, which is good to know. So thanks for bringing that up. Um, I know it's, I mean, when talking about a fatality at all, there's always the issue of sensitivity, but I'm hoping that by triggering some kind of review and to make sure it doesn't happen again, it's, you know, maybe instead of sensationalizing it, it's maybe honoring that, you know, the memory of the person who's lost and trying to make sure there's another one, right? So I don't know. Um, in the Multimodal Transportation Commission, we've occasionally t- um, taken a look at engineering design standards for streets. And there's a lot of um, research nationally and internationally that shows that the way streets are kind of geometrically formed can influence driving behaviors and can reduce um, collisions. So probably something to look at. and. Once again, it's one of those things where that's kind of where I'm hoping my involvement on this committee can help me bring those ideas and concepts back to MMTC and see if we can, you know, roll it into our own policies. Jessica Mortinger, Transportation Planning Manager. So I want to be respectful of everyone's time. We put on your calendar till 7.30. So we have about 12 minutes and there's some uh, uh, representation that you haven't had a chance to share your thoughts about this and give you a chance to do that before um, we wrap up and tell you how we intend to use this. Althea Schnocky at large. I wanted to piggyback a little bit on what Laura was talking about that Naismith Trail is a really good example of a lower, in- it feeds into a lower income area, but there's no sidewalks in this lower income area. And I appreciate that looking at lower income and minority groups and disabled people looking at those areas that tend to be underserved in Lawrence, but also tend to be near bigger intersections. Like 23rd and Naismith's not a small intersection, but the sidewalks and the speeds around there are very high. Hi, I'm Frankie Haynes. Um, and I, I, I've been kind of quiet. I've just been kind of absorbing, you know, what the plan has been thus far. And I am also somebody who is a major pedestrian in Lawrence, especially Um, When I first started living in Lawrence, I didn't drive. I didn't um, get a driver's license until I was 21. Um, So I utilized the bus and walking very frequently. And, you know, all of these are great ideas, but I'm just starting to wrap like, so now I live in North Lawrence. And what I'm trying to wrap my head around is how do you even begin with a place like North Lawrence, which is so lacking in any infrastructure and, there will never be a safe way for me to walk to get food because there is no food in walking distance in North Lawrence, which is a problem that, you know, we continue to talk about. And there are lots and lots of places that have no sidewalk, but to um, to Nick's point, you know, it isn't really a problem because most people don't go very fast in North Lawrence. And perhaps maybe it's just a matter of more speed limit posting signs on the side on the on the streets that don't have sidewalks um because we definitely don't have any money <laughs> the people who own houses in north lawrence <laughs> generally don't have any money to build sidewalks 
So I don't know, I'm just kind of thinking about North Lawrence is one place that is severely underdeveloped, but there are other places, other pockets of Lawrence that are severely underdeveloped. And it's like, how do you start, how do you even begin with this kind of planning in places like this? So anyway, um, but I'm really excited about this and I've been really um, interested in everybody's ideas. So thank you. Jessica Martin, your transportation planning manager. Frankie, I think those are con some concepts we're going to have conversations about because um, many of those neighborhoods that were underdeveloped were developed at a time when there was no requirement to develop uh, develop that infrastructure. And so there are um, some engineering standards for shared streets. And what does that mean? And and if that's the long, is that the long-term vision? Is it not the long-term vision? And I think those are the types of conversations where Lan when Lance talks about what is, it's great to look at national best practices, but what does it mean to Lawrence and our unique neighborhoods? I think that's where we're going to have to um, realize what that value is um, and try to reflect that in a plan moving to move forward. Um, and it's not going to be overnight. And obviously this pedestrian issue is not standalone because like you mentioned, location of places like grocery stores matter too. Um, and so um, thinking about that, I think will be important in tying that back. I mean, that's part of what community health planning has tried to tried to work on with food access and other things. And so I think they are multifaceted issues and your perspective will be really valuable. Um, this is Laura McCulloch. I just wondered if there would be an opportunity to look at um, in neighborhoods that don't have sidewalks and maybe don't have aren't well lit. If there's opportunities to look at at least one of those, because um, you know at nighttime if there's not not sidewalks um, and there's not really street lights, that could really be a hazard for the pedestrians in those neighborhoods. Yeah, Laura. I really Frankie Haynes here. Um, I really like that idea. I mean, I think it is a matter of. Um, you know, for places that are underdeveloped, that we'll be able to get some, but not all. And eventually we'll be able to, you know, have it in this, you know, have it be more optimal. Not that that's a really a real way to use the word optimal, but you understand what I mean. <laughs> Gregory Critchlow with um, MMPC. You know, I, I'm listening to a lot of the comments and some of the experiences that I've, I had uh, on the other side as an architect and design. Uh, and design, you know, working with cities, a lot of times you, you were talking about capital or lack of capital representation. And I know in bigger cities uh, where I travel back and forth from is that uh, the municipalities will try to really um, harness that capital. And so Lawrence, in terms of the experience that I've been in here thus far, is, is on kind of the same trajectory in terms of development. And there's a lot of people who are interested in property. And it sounds like, uh, you know, part of the conversations that we're having here be implemented in a zoning code. And so as a developer, yeah, the, the right of ways and the sidewalks will be starting to become part of the projects, not just the piece of architecture. Um, and if, if that is not the case, then I think uh, a part of this committee and other advisory committees should really make a push to make it part of the zoning code because that's when it, you, know, you start to really see change is when these new projects come in, even in neighborhoods. And you'd be, it's really interesting, the neighborhoods that don't seem to have a lot of capital seem to be the most interest to a lot of developers because they can get in at a less expensive price um, you know, buy less, sell more. Um, but at the same time, there's opportunities for those neighborhoods to really have their infrastructure updated in a more expedient nature because the projects are at a different time frame than just depending on city, um, the city itself. So, and then, you know, I, I do appreciate the examples that uh, Nick is showing in terms of uh, a lot of the overseas uh, uh, ways they set up their their streets but that's a big cultural difference than we have here and it's not just Lawrence it's the United States you know we really value the automobile um, and the automobile lobby and I think at some point and I've learned this the hard way is that we have to kind of design for who we are as a culture um, you know that that curve has been initiated as 
kind of the safety procedure uh, because people like to drive faster. Um, and yes, the, uh, the NAPTO has put some design guides out there if you uh, decrease the uh, width of streets, you know, because our streets, current streets are based off a highway width of 12 feet or more. And that helps people feel more comfortable driving a little bit faster, if not um, a lot faster. And sometimes even when you narrow the streets, it doesn't always uh, translate into a slower traffic understanding. So I think it's, it's one of those, um, unfortunately, slow moving wheels, but you know, hopefully design and these kind of conversations will help uh, us understand there is uh, the opportunity to share on the streets. Uh, and I see this as a, as a person who doesn't own a car but being in situations who, where um, just because I'm not in a car, uh, you face antagonizing, um, almost intimidating understanding of um, being a pedestrian or a cyclist or whatever, um, because you don't have that protection. So. Thank you, Mac. I'm MTC rep. Well, we have three minutes left, so I guess if there's any last comments, um, I would say now is the time. But really, there's going to be more of these meetings, so it's not the only time. <laughs> No pressure. Yeah. Jessica, is there any chance to have public comment at these meetings? I know they're open to the public, but I don't know if there's any mechanism to actually solicit public comment during the meeting. Should we ask somebody? Yeah, Jessica Martin, your transportation planning manager. So in these steering committee formats, traditionally from the MPO process, um, we have left kind of discretion of public to receive public comment, we can receive, we tell on the agenda, people can submit that in writing. Um, if there were people signed up in advance um, to do that, we could, we would notify you and we would do kind of discretion of the chair to solicit and hear that feedback and perspective ar around any of those, of those issues. Okay. Sounds good. We'll uh, keep an eye on that. I saw some folks on the call earlier who weren't on the committee or on staff so I figured but it looks like they're not here anymore so oh well next time sure. sounds good I guess uh do, do I need to close yeah. the meeting or is that is that on you I have a, a couple more things real good. quick Okay, so Jessica Morton, your transportation planning manager. So our hope is to bring back to you um, the, a scope of work that's refined um, with some with kind of that, what we envision to be the draft public participation plan, what we would lay out as the process based on what you've told us and which things we believe we would want to seek um, feedback from the committee for, for your October meeting. Um, and then uh, with, your, with your feedback, make any uh, changes to that plan and process to get underway um, with, with soliciting that input from the community um, for us all to then come back and evaluate. As, at the same time, we'll be internally working on um, staff, some staff research and following up on some of the issues you raised and making sure we have things like the streetlight policy and finding out what the GIS information is for, for, if, for what we have for streets and that's uh, for streetlights, excuse me, not streets. Um, and um, so we'll be doing, we'll be doing a lot of that and hopefully we'll be bringing back some of that data and process to you as well um, that we've kind of envisioned as um, to replicate the tools and the uh, coordination with the existing process. So we'll look forward to seeing you in October. If you have anything for us you think about before then, if you see anything, if you have any thoughts or follow up about anything, if you dig back, come back through what we've presented you, please feel free to email Ashley or I. We'd be happy to get more information or follow up or um, reflect it in, in the work that we're doing. But we're very thankful for your time tonight. And unless anybody has anything else, we will see you in October. I'm good. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye.